This is Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. All right, guys, today we've got a special guest on the podcast, a return guest on the podcast, the one and only Eddie Penny. He is a retired Navy SEAL. He spent 12 years in the SEAL teams, and six of those was with the Naval Special Warfare Development Group. Before that, he was in the United States Marine Corps as an infantryman and also an urban terrain instructor. He's also the CEO and founder of Contingent Group, which was founded in 2013. They are a worldwide uh, risk mitigation, security consulting, and executive asset protection company. They've been around for a long time doing great, great work. He's also the creator of the Unafraid mindset. And that has led him really to his his latest accomplishment, which is being the author of a brand new book out right now. It's his autobiography called Unafraid. But most importantly, he is the first ever guest of Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. Of all the things that he has done in his life and in his career, that is the number one thing above all else that is higher on his mantle than any other accomplishment, obviously. So if you go all the way back to episode 100 of this podcast, he was the very, very first guest, and then he came back on during our Botching Afghanistan story. So what we're going to be doing, our, our, our little series we did on the Botching of Afghanistan last summer, but what we're going to be doing with this interview is we spent a lot of time talking to Eddie about a lot of different subjects, and we're going to break this up into two parts, okay? Because I know some of you guys, you know, you look at a podcast, and you're like, oh, that's going to be like two, two and a half hours long. I don't know if I have time for that. So we're going to break it up and also to give you a little bit more time to kind of engage with the content. But in part one, the one you're about to listen to, we're going to get into some subjects that are outside the book. So we're going to talk about the rise of mass shootings, the supposed rise of mass shootings, but also just having situational awareness. Why after the age of 40, he decided he wanted to start as a white belt in jujitsu and also to train a little bit of Muay Thai and, you know, kind of what it looks like there, but also kind of this diversity, equity, and inclusion focus in the United States military. But then we're going to get into the book. So we're going to talk about why he wrote the autobiography. And then we're going to get into a lot of stuff in the book, you know, his relationship with his father and how that affected his adult relationships, you know, why he joined the military when he feels like he became a man, a great story when he feels like he knew the moment he became a man and how uh, missing a single long range shot while in the United States Marine Corps literally changed the trajectory of his entire life, why he knew he wouldn't quit whenever he got to Bud's, where he was on 9-11, the strain his job had on his wife and children. We get into a lot of that. We get into the green team screening he went through. We even get into his first kill and that's how we're going to wrap up today's episode is his first kill and his overall relationship with killing. But before we get to that interview, I do want to go ahead and make you guys aware of a new sponsor that we have for the show, and that is Kansas City Cattle Company. Now, guys, there are a lot of meat delivery subscription services out there, like a ton of them, and you've heard a lot advertised on a lot of different podcasts, but there is currently only one of them that is United States military veteran owned, United States military veteran operated, and all of the beef, chicken, and pork products that they produce and that they sell are made here and produced here in the United States. The only company that does that is Kansas City Cattle Company. So this company specializes in Wagyu beef. And so before I kind of came across this company, I had heard of Wagyu beef and I knew it was kind of like this fancy thing that, you know, it was, you know, this really amazing cut of beef, but it's like, I was never really around that, especially not growing up, but I had never tried it before I came across Kansas City Cattle Company or KC Cattle Company. So if you don't know this, because I didn't know this, so I had to learn it, Wagyu beef, it's a particular breed of cattle that is known for its mutations that allow for like 10 times the amount of intramuscular fat. So what does that even mean? That means you're going to have way more marbling on the meat. So if you know anything about steaks, you know that if you have a good marble on the steak, that's going to lead to an unbelievable taste. And so they sent me some stuff before we kind of set off this this whole advertising thing and they sent me my favorite steak that I've that I've ever had my favorite cut of steak which is a bone in ribeye and so here I am for like a few days beforehand I'm like okay kind of getting myself pumped up because it's like you don't want to mess up this steak it's a fancy piece of meat look at all that marbling you can't jack it up and so I literally spent days kind of preparing what I was going to do and so this is how, how I cook my steak so basically what I do is I get a cast iron skillet I get it as hot as it can possibly be uh, about an hour before I put the steak on you know I'll take it out of the refrigerator and I'll, I'll put it on the countertop. I'll cover that in 
coarse salt, not regular salt, not table salt, but coarse salt and uh, cracked pepper, like black pepper, and maybe some garlic powder, but I didn't do that on this particular one. Let it get to room temperature. I get that cast iron skillet as hot as it can go. I put oil in there, so you can do avocado oil or olive oil or something like that. And then I sear both sides for like 30 or 45 seconds, right? And so uh, that really gets that, that sear, that initial sear on either sides. Then I turn the heat down to kind of like medium heat or something like that. Throw a ton of butter in uh in the pan throw a little bit of garlic in there if you have time you can throw that in there as well or other you know herbals or whatever things like that and then basically i will kind of flip it whenever it wherever it's necessary but i'll be like basting it with the butter inside of there and i took it off and I cooked it perfectly. I mean, guys, I was so nervous because I have a bad meat thermometer. I need a, a thera, thermopin or therapin or whatever, but the one I have is that great, but I took it off and it was a perfect rare, medium rare, but the outside was crispy. And when I took the very, very first bite of this thing, I was like, oh, okay. That's what everyone's talking about when they're talking about Wagyu beef steaks. And again, it was my favorite steak cut, but I mean, it was just unbelievably buttery and smoky and it just, it was a perfect steak and I'm so, so glad they sent it my way. And I want you guys to make sure that you can go out and try their products. So we set up this deal. I'm so glad to bring it to you guys. So if you go to kccattlecompany.com, Okay, that's kccattlecompany.com, like Kansas City, kccattlecompany.com. Use the promo code Kyle to get 15% off of your order. Again, that promo code is just my first name, Kyle. That's K-Y-L-E for 15% off of your order at kccattlecompany.com. All right, guys, that has been a long enough intro. I've kept Eddie Penny from you guys too long as it is, so we're not going to keep him from you any longer. So without further ado, let's get into it. Eddie Penny, welcome back to Undaunted Life of Man's podcast. Thanks, Kyle. I appreciate it, man. Great to be here again. Dude, third time on this show. Like, I, I feel like I'm getting the most out of the package deal I bought from you years and years ago because you and I were just talking about it. Like, you and I have been friends for over a decade at this point, but you've, I, you, we've only ever been in the same place once. Like That's in crazy. our entire life, like it doesn't That's make crazy. sense. That's crazy. But uh, <laughs> dude, I, I'm so thankful for your friendship, and we'll get into Likewise, way later buddy. in this podcast. We got a lot of stuff to uh, to take care of. I appreciate you sporting the hat. Uh, that is a a great look on you. I know you're the flat bill hat guy, so I Love appreciate it, you sporting it. Uh, one of these days, I'll, I'll have to uh, pick up one of your shirts. So on the next podcast, when we have you on, I'm wearing your swag as well. But um, we're having you on today because you you've done something really incredible. You've written a book, which I, I think you're the first Navy SEAL to actually do that, to actually write a book. Um, so that that's a really great you know feather you can put in your cap. But uh, before we get into that, there's a lot of topics that I think are important that I think you can give us a unique perspective on. Uh, and the first one is what we're seeing now with a lot of these mass shootings. Uh, obviously, we talked about the one that happened in Buffalo. Uh, the most sensational uh, of all of them in a negative way is the one that happened in Uvalde. We yeah. just had one recently uh, in Chicago, uh, you know, one prominent one in Chicago because it was a white guy that did it and he shot white people, but you know, they don't really care about the people that are shot every weekend in that city. About the other 70 that happened that same weekend. Yeah, absolutely. The ones that didn't fit a particular narrative. Um, And we've got a lot to cover today, so we can only do kind of surface level stuff, but I know you've done some training. You've trained civilians on active shooter situations on situational awareness, and, and you've worked with fortune 500 companies and you've done a lot of stuff in that area, but I'm seeing a lot of people, even on the pro gun side, even on the Christian side, that are reacting negatively to these things. They're, they're starting to talk about the firearms a whole lot more than they are talking about the evil that's going on in the hearts of the people that are perpetrating these crimes. I did a debate recently with a pacifist, anti-gun Christian leader, and this is what he goes. He goes around the country convincing law-abiding citizens to turn their firearms in so that they can be destroyed right in front of them, uh, basically making these people less safe, making them targets. But for you, uh, from your history and from your background, what are your overall thoughts on what we're seeing because by statistically speaking, we're not having a major uptick in these shootings. They're just getting more coverage in the media. So take that wherever you want to go with it. Yeah, I, I, obviously, any anytime I hear like, oh, it's the gun's fault, it's the gun fault, it's really, it's just, it's almost, it's just mind boggling. It's just like, it's the car's fault that I was texting and driving and I happened to hit a cyclist, you know, riding on it. It's, it's not the car's fault, it's your fault. And it's yeah. the it's the operator of the firearm, whatever it is, because we can go to any other countries. Our countries look at knives, look at blunt objects, look at our fists, our feet. Do we take away our fists then? Well, I mean, what do we do? Do we take away all the pills, all the all the other things that cause death? Um, a gun is nothing but a paperweight. That's it. Until it gets behind somebody that's either good or evil, 
And if you start taking away the good guys, evil will dominate. And you just got to look at certain cities to see this unfold. We, we mentioned Chicago. They have some very strict gun laws, very strict gun laws, some of the strictest in the country. And I believe them, L.A. and New York City have the most crime because it's the bad guys running rampant. Good guys can't protect themselves. Right. And are you going to stop all school, school shootings, which is the top that we started this conversation on? Absolutely not. You're not. But instead of having 14 deaths, maybe with a good guy with a gun, we only have two deaths. That's still like not okay. That still sucks, but that's called reality. That is that is the reality of it. You will definitely deter and um, delay certain deaths from happening by having good guys with it, with uh, particular. And it doesn't come down to the gun, man. Uh, training, protocols, mm-hmm. policy. Like there's so many things that go into it that really don't cost a lot of money. It's just really, you know, filling that brain up with this stuff that people need to know. But yeah, it's not the gun's fault. It, it, that is the mo- that is the dumbest thing I think I've ever heard. I've heard a lot of dumb things. That's pretty dumb. <laughs> well, what's funny is it is a, it is a lack of reality. These people have this this really warped sense of evil in people. They just assume if they close their eyes and plug their ears that the evil will go away and yes. won't exist anymore. And like that's a point that I brought up in that debate. I I, br- I pulled out my BCM rifle. I put a thirty round magazine in it, and I and I ran it, and I left it on safety, and I set it down in front of me, and I said, "Let's see if any point during this conversation, if this rifle will jump up and get any any of us, like we'll do anything." And it's like you're absolutely right. Like one of the questions was, "Should Christians own deadly weapons?" And I'm like, you know trying not to sound like Jean-Claude Van Damme or, or Steven Seagal, but it's like my hands are deadly weapons because more people are killed with hands, feet, and fists than our rifles every single year by like 50%, uh, you know, over that. And so, or, or McDonald's, <laughs> right. I mean, people are killed in any number of ways. Like there are just as many people that die from falling off ladders almost as, as people that are killed with rifles. But we, we try to demonize this thing, which is absolutely just a tool. And so to, to go from, you know, a really serious situation to, to slightly less serious, um, you know, kind of talking about, you know, your hands and feet being weapons. One thing that's really interesting about you, which kind of, you know, shows uh, your ability to, to kind of humble yourself is you started training jujitsu in the gi and Muay Thai. And I think you started after your 40th birthday, right? And you just recently got your blue belt in jujitsu. So congratulations on that. That is a Thank huge, you. huge deal. Don't get the blue belt blues. Keep things going. No, keep no, no, no. I keep hearing about like, don't get up. Like, I won't, I won't, I won't. I promise. No, no, no. Like, uh, <laughs> blue belts aren't dangerous. Uh, purple belts and above that, that's when you really start understanding things. It's kind of like what Jocko says. He's like, you know, a purple belt's not going to get whooped in a street fight unless it's by another purple belt or a brown belt or a black belt or something mm-hmm. like that. So for you, kind of explain that to me because you had nothing to prove. You have nothing to prove physically like i know you've had some injuries but like you're you're a good uh like you're a physical guy you're an athletic guy all those things and you've proven that for multiple decades why get into something that basically puts you back on step one uh i like goals i like uh competitions i like uh going for something right like striving for that thing that that uh that goal and you know accomplishing the task to get there uh, and jujitsu was one of them. It's like, man, there's a lot of guys talked about it. Why don't you, and, and I had buddies all the time. I always would go uh, gravitate towards the weights. And I did I did some MMA stuff for a couple of years, uh, but then it left for about 10 to 15 years. And then started going, just started going back. I was like, man, I'll do it. I started with boxing. I was starting to feel good getting that blank, uh, blood flow to the brain. You know, that runner's high, just started feeling so good. Like, And I'm not mm-hmm. a big cardio guy. I don't, I'm not a fan of cardio. I'm, right. I'm, just, I'm not, to be honest with you. Yep. But if I'm going to do some kind of cardiovascular training, I want to learn while I'm doing it. And self-defense, obviously, is that answer. So start with boxing, kind of graduated to Muay Thai a little bit and other striking. And then I was like, man, I got to like my strike. My striking coach is like, dude, you got to try jujitsu. And I and I was what you just said, like, I don't want to go back. I don't want to get humbled by pride. And I was like, dude, you talk mindset all the time. You've got this unafraid thing. You you like you. I, I, was, I had this conversation, this self-talk, like, Eddie, be quiet and go do it. <laughs> right. So I went, and it's been amazing, and I'm so glad I did it. And that great people, uh, filling that camaraderie void that I missed from the from the team, so the guys in my gym kind of kind of filled that, that brotherhood piece. Um, met great people, and, it, 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 dude, it's a lot of fun. Like, yes, I deal with injuries. I've got a lot of issues, but you just kind of change your game to – to that, whatever it is. And it's, uh, it's been awesome, man. You know, the deal, you know, the deal, (laughs) dude, I I do. It's something that I talk about often. People get tired of it, but I'm like, you don't understand it until you try it. And it's like, I tell people don't, don't just try one class, go until you can submit somebody that's on your level physically 
and then determine what it's like from there. Because that first time you take someone's back, you know, you put in a, you know, body triangle and then you sink in a rear naked choke and they tap. It's like in that moment, you realize if this was a real situation, if this was a, a, a real kinetic situation, that fight's over and you're the one that ended it. And that life of that person might be over and you would have been the one that ended it. And like, but again, like that, that's kind of a little bit too carnal for some people, but it's like, dude, it's it reality is, though. That's absolutely. reality. Like reality is there are bad guys out there. 70 deaths in Chicago this past weekend. It's out there. Like, it's crazy. Like guys, the chances of it happen are very slim, but like I, I, I gave a speech this a uh, couple weekends ago and I was like, no victim ever woke up and uh, woke up and said, today I will be the victim. It just right. happens. You got to be right. ready to go. So what does that mean? You carry a firearm, you're trained mm -hmm. in it, jujitsu, striking, all that, all these things go into it, man. Well, and Eddie, you fall to the level of your training. Obviously you've heard that before, but I know some concealed carry guys that won't learn how to fight with their hands and feet. They're like, I, I got a gun. Why would I need to do that? Yeah, and it's like, because not every situation requires you to pull your pistol and point it at somebody and potentially in their life. If you can end a threat, by, by passing the guy out cold and then taking off running or, you know, holding them down in neon belly until help arrives or, you know, immobilizing them with some sort of a heel hook or, you know, breaking their arm or something like that, which basically would take away their will to fight. There's a lot of different scenarios that, that would aid you and benefit you. And it's also just a confidence thing, knowing that when you walk into a place, it's like, if something pops off and gets a little bit crazy, I've got the required tools. I've got the skill sets physically. You know, Pat McNamara talks about the, the combat chassis, like my chassis is ready to go if I need mm -hmm. to run away from this situation or if I need to get involved physically. So I, I think that's a very important thing. So I commend you on doing that. I know it's not an easy path and it's, it's not fun. easy for, it, the, for anybody. The thing that is, to. is people don't realize like, oh, I just carry a gun. Like you just said, I carry a yeah. gun. Okay. You shoot somebody or pull it out and don't shoot somebody. You're going to court, brother. That yep. could be jail time, especially some jurisdictions. Goodbye. They're not very gun friendly, which is mm -hmm. ridiculous. But like, yeah, if you can use the lowest means, whatever to apprehend or take out the threat, I would absolutely do that. Like a gun is a last resort. Yeah. Plain and simple, man. Plain yeah, and it's, simple. So, yeah. it's potentially tens of thousands of dollars in legal fees, potentially a jail stay, potentially, you know, Stress, having to fight. Oh my God. Oh my like, gosh. Like, 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 to... house. like, can you imagine that guy? Like, yeah. dude, dude, uh, yeah, it's Not next cool. level. So, so I think uh, I think you and I are certainly on the same page. We could talk for the next two hours about that, but we have a lot more ground to cover. But before we get into your book, which I want to spend a lot of time with, uh, I do want to talk to you from your perspective because something that I've heard, and I know I get a lot of crap for talking to SEALs on the show. Here's the thing, guys. I'll talk to anybody. I'll talk to Delta. I'll talk to SF. Like The SEALs are the ones writing books. So if you want to come on the show, write a book and we'll make it happen. But the thing about it is I'm hearing from a lot of us, specifically Spec Ops guys, is something along the lines of, you know, when I had Clint Emerson on here recently, he was like, man, I'm glad I got out of the military when I did. Mm -hmm. And it's mainly because of what we see with the, the failure upward of a lot of the generals, the situation that we saw with Afghanistan, which we've already had you on to talk about that, you know, what we're seeing in Ukraine, this kind of proxy war thing with Russia, but this overall wokeness in the military, uh, we just got reports this month that the, uh, all branches of, uh, the military are way below their recruiting goals for the year because here they are. Yeah, they're, they're advertising, you know, uh, gay weddings and, and two mommies and all these different things. And what they're not getting, they're not getting the good old country boy from, from that just loves his country and loves the American flag and, and wants to defend her still today. Right. And then they're they're just shocked when these guys are like, man, I don't really want to go to the academy, man. I don't really want to go the, the ROTC route. I don't really want to do that. Like, I want to do something else. I, I guess I'll be an entrepreneur. I guess I'll do something else. But for you. Talk to me a little bit about that, because from my perspective, it seems like the United States military is very, very focused on diversity, equity and inclusion and wokeness and not as much on lethality anymore. Which is ridiculous because it's a very small percentage that gives a crap about this. It's a, they're just they got the loud voice in the room. And right now we're in a society, the loudest voice in the room is going to prevail. And that voice is those pushing what you just talked about. It's ridiculous. We're, we're getting away from like manhood. Like this is what it means to support this country and fight for the citizens of this amazing nation. And we're going to it. You're, you're forcing people, you're forcing them to do things that a very large, I mean, a gigantic of the majority doesn't want to do or doesn't believe in. They're doing it to maintain that paycheck or do something they really believe in. And going back to like, I, I think we're trying to go into like, should people go into the military? And, and I always say this is like, you have got to go with that heart if it was me personally, I don't know what I would say. 
I, I know that I would be thinking real hard before I was like, go, go, go America, mm-hmm. America, America, red, white, and blue all day long. But now it's like, it's a joke. It, and it's not the people again. It's what this country is now like we stand for or what this administration is trying to put out. And it, it it's almost, it's honestly the most disgusting thing I think I've ever witnessed. Uh, it is gross. We are being mocked by other countries. We are being mocked by our own people for, 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 for stuff that's actually happening, not like fantasy land, but actual things that are happening. We're pushing agenda that has nothing to do with morals and ethics or like keeping this country safe. And that's what the military's for. It, a, a rainbow flag, which is not even supposed to be representing what we think it represents, mm-hmm. is not supposed to be flashed in the military. Plain and simple, end of story, done. They have a problem with beards sometimes. Oh, you didn't shave, but, but we're going to change everything to this? It's ridiculous, man. It is one-sided it's a political agenda, and they're just trying to do to appease a, a very small percentage, man. And like, honestly, shame on them. Shame on them. Well, and it's going to be uh, egg on all of our faces at some point if we have to get into another kinetic situation. And oh, we're going to we wonder don't... what happened. What happened? Yeah. Where, where's yeah. our warriors? I'll, I'll exactly. tell you where they are. That's what I tell. That's what I told again. Going back to this debate I get did with this pacifist Christian guys. It's like, dude, if you and I are ever in the same restaurant together, you know, having having a meal together, breaking bread, and someone comes in and, and tries to kill a bunch of people, you're going to be one of the people that's hiding behind a guy like me, hoping I take out the threat before he gets to you. Or if a guy like me is not there, you're going to be the one looking around for the sheepdog. And if there's no sheepdogs available, you're going to be the one lamenting, "Where are all the sheepdogs? Where are all the sheepdogs?" It's like, yeah, exactly. well, y- you exactly. got rid of them. Like exactly. you got rid of those guys and you stopped recruiting them. You stopped catering to them because if the military starts looking around, wondering where the sheepdogs are, this country is in a major, major world of hurt, but we got to kind of put that to bed. I dude, we, we might just need to have you back on just to talk about <laughs> social and cultural Honest. stuff because I want to get you into that, but we got to talk about your new book. It's called unafraid guys. If you were listening to this on time, it is now available. It is in the show notes. It is your autobiography. So it's just, I told you this off air, but I'll say it again here. I've read a lot of military books, you know, the, and there I was military books. A lot of them were great. Some of them were pretty average. Some of them you're like, I can kind of tell that you were just kind of like infusing a little bit of drama to make your story a little bit more exciting. But I think that, that you did a great job and, and you co-wrote it with a guy named Keith Wood. Um, and you have some very unique things. Like you don't have, you know, chapter one, two, three, four, five, you, you do a, you know, based on the military alphabet. So alpha, bravo, Charlie, and you kind of go through. So that's kind of unique. So guys, as we go through this interview, I'll be referring to those chapters in that, uh, that way. But I guess just generically, Eddie, before we start digging in, you know, piece by piece going through the book, why write a book? Why feel like you needed to write, you know, and there I was kind of military memoir type book. Why did you write it with a co-author, Keith Wood? How did that process go? Just go. All right. Story time. Uh, so yep. this, this book, and I've always been the guy that like, here, here's hypocritical Eddie again. Like, I can't believe we're writing books We're writing books, but the, the bottom line is, man, a lot of guys that tell stories, they're, they're, they're telling history. We read history all the time, right, about Abe Lincoln or World War II or, or whatever it is, the Korean War. We just go back, and, and that helps us. History is what saves lives, in my opinion, as we go back, like, they made this mistake. All right, they did this. All right, so we're going to try this. Uh, in 2014, when I was in, living in Tulsa, Oklahoma, I woke up in the middle of the night, and I heard, all I heard was seriously was write a book. And I'm like, okay, that what a crazy dream. I'm not writing a book because I don't like to write. So I'm trying to go back to sleep and obviously tossing and turning, couldn't get back up. I was like, fine. So I go to my office, grab a legal pad and a pen. I sit up in my bed and I kind of outline all the chapters. Pretty much the chapters we see now are pretty much the chapters that happen. A little bit of tossing and turn, a little bit of adding some things, especially towards the end. But that's where it started. So I wrote, I was like, man, all right, I'm going to dig into some some specific stories. And it was kind of therapeutic. I was just kind of journaling, never did it before. Uh, and, I, and I got about 150 pages of just like words. Uh, and, and, and the book started out, the name was like going to be Facade. It's just like, like fake, honestly, like inside, like, you know, you're this Navy SEAL. People think you're this, but really inside you're, you're just tearing yourself apart. You're, you're in pain and you're drinking yourself to sleep with a bunch of pills. Uh, so that was the initial thing and that got shelved for a while until probably 2018 ish i did a shooting course with keith wood i met him so i I met him through the nra i was working with the nra doing a shooting course uh, with a bunch of ex spec op guys and he was writing for him he writes for guns and uh, ammo he co-authored the terminal list uh and whatever the second book of that one was 
uh, he did he did those. So he's a really great writer. So I did the Mike Ritland podcast, and a lot of people are like, "Hey, man, you should write a book. You should write a book." And I was like, uh, "Okay." It was like it was a great podcast, man. It was a, it was a good podcast. And uh, so I I sent the I sent the link to Keith because I knew he he wrote. I was like, "Hey, man, do me a favor and listen to this and tell me if there's a um, a book in it." So he listened to it. Like in a day later, he gets back and we were talking. I was like, hey, buddy, would you be up for co author And he's like, dude, he's like, I was hoping you'd ask. And uh, we just started going. And then we, he flew down. We did a bunch of recordings, started making the chapters. He would send it back. I would edit them, edit them, send it back to him. And we just did this back and forth. And then, I mean, it just, we went very slow, took a long time. The DOD process because of COVID, people mm-hmm. leaving that bill, it took eight months uh, so it, it's just been, it's been a process. Uh, we're about to start the audio book. I got a call I actually um, here in a little bit to go over to set that up. Cause I'm going to, I'm going to do the reading, uh, which I don't want to, cause I know I'm going to cry, but the, here's the deal, man. We're keeping that stuff. I want the realism. I want the transparency. And some of that stuff hurts to talk about, dude. I'm not going to lie. Like I, I spent a lot of times sitting right here at my desk, reading, editing, writing, crying. And I just, you know, it's therapeutic and it hurt and it felt good and I liked it. And that's just what it was, man. It's uh, it's all it's all out for the world to know, and I and the reason for that is there's a lot of people going through some stuff, man. As you know, this we got a lot of demons, dude. We we're facing them in some way, shape, or form, and I hope that this serves as a way as like, hey, it's all right. There is light, like there is that light. You just gotta find what that is. For me, it was Christianity, one hundred percent. That might not be the answer for everyone right away. It might not be the answer. I don't know. But what I'm saying is we don't give up that battle. We don't take our own lives. We don't stuff our issues with a bottle and pills and whatever syringes or whatever you want to, a, a pound of freaking Coke with your face buried in it. We just don't do that stuff. There, there's a better way to handle things. And it's just a small obstacle that we got to overcome for an amazing life. And that's that's kind of like what I really hope for this book. <laughs> Yeah, again, I think you did a great job, guys. It'll be in the show notes. There, There's no way possible. We're going to spend quite a bit of time on the book today. There's no way possible to get into all the stories and all the details. I'm going to be skipping over a lot of it, so you're going to have to go get your own copy and check it out. Um, one thing I did want to make, this is kind of a house cleaning thing I meant to ask you off air. You never refer specifically to what we know colloquially as the team that you ended up on while yeah. you were in the Navy. So you called it like the special group or the, the you know, or something like the command. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can, right. that, that's one thing that redacted from DOD is they don't want you associating that organization with specific ops. Okay. That's, so, that's what we waited for eight months for. You, there wasn't a lot. You could see it. It wasn't, there no, wasn't a lot. So. Right. I saw it was redacted and those different things. So in this conversation today, are we able to, to use kind of the, the normal name or how you guys it, would describe it? Or special work for a development kit, our tier one unit for the SEAL teams. Okay. Everyone, fair enough. If you don't know what it is, Google it and you'll see it. Yeah. You guys know what uh, the development five group plus is. One. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> there you go. So, That's ridiculous. Like, it's not like everyone knows, guys. Right. It's like I, I've talked to people on this show that just talked about it, that they're like, oh, yeah, this was it, and this is how we do it. And then other people are like off air, like, dude, don't don't say this. Don't say that. I'm not allowed to say it. So I just want to make sure I didn't trip on anybody. But I want to talk You're about uh, something from the very beginning in Chapter Alpha. Um, you talked about your dad, and this is kind of a I through did. point for, your, for the entire thing. And again, we'll talk more about your dad a little bit later. But you have this quote here. He was a great guy, but I don't think I'm being unfair when I say that his priorities were not at home in those years. His tendency to stay away from the house as often as possible spelled trouble for my parents' marriage, and that absence combined with his frequent alcohol use led my parents to divorce uh, when I was seven. <clears throat> so, Eddie, I know you know this because you're a very you know self-reflective guy. That sentence or that paragraph could have been written about you. That could have been 100%. written about about your career and your family and your relationships. I and think again, it was throughout the book. I, I think I rewrote it in the. It, it was, man. It was. Yeah. Well, you did. Exactly. So we'll, we'll peel back the onion quite a bit, and we're not going to be able to get dig into a, as much of the the family stuff that went down because you detail that very very well in the book. But I guess let's start there with your relationship with your dad. This is a guy you gave your trident to after the after you passed buds after you got your trident you gave it to your dad and your dad has it to this day so it's not like you don't like your dad but you know some of the same things you struggle with being away from home all the time and you know being focused on work you saw that from your dad so is that why you did it i i think is i always wanted to prove to my dad i'm gonna get choked up <laughs> let's go we're like 20 minutes uh, into this thing like no, let's I know, get it. No, I, I, you know, you, you know, it is, man, your father, like we want to be the, as we've learned at wild at heart, right. We want to be the apple in his eye, like period, just like with our father, like with God, like we want to be like, Hey, are you proud of me? And I, and I don't know if I, 
got that throughout my my life. Uh, and it's just somebody be like, hey, look, I got to try it. Hey, look, I did this. Hey, look. And I was, he was always the first one I'd call. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember one time we were going to a Bengals game a couple years back. And uh, he looked at me and he goes, I am so proud of you, bro. Tears. Yeah. Like freaking just done. Cause I don't, I don't recall hearing that. It's just, um, you know, we always say like words don't matter, brother. They matter. Like, especially when it comes to your father, like I'm proud of you. Like I amounted, are you like you did well in my eyes? Like that's everything. That is like everything. And, um, yeah. So I remember just seeing my dad, I looked at him like a larger than life figure. Like when he dove down to get that anchor, I was like, dude, you're ridiculous. Like that was the coolest thing in the freaking world. And, uh, he just, I wanted to, I wanted him to be proud of me. Uh, it, dude, as a father now, again, I've got, I've got a two year old and a, a four month old now. And it's just like, okay, pressure's on, right? It's just, it's a different situation. And it's similar to how you were with, it's with not your, easy, man. It's, it's not easy. No, it's not easy. And, and around this time and, and in that chapter, you kind of talked about how you had some of your first, you know, thoughts on religion and how, you know, you, you weren't exactly agnostic, but you weren't exactly atheist. Uh, but you, you really just kind of put, you know, put that, that religion part, you kind of couched a little bit, which is similar because your dad wasn't an overly religious guy. And, and again, we'll get way more later on into some of the things that, that, that looks like, but you, you were a very patriotic person from the very beginning, going back to episode 100 of this podcast, you are our first guest. You kind of told us about the first time you felt like, no, I'm going to go to the military. And guys, if, if you want to make sure you get that story, go back to episode 100 or get the book and read it. But a lot of what the military thing is, and this is why I kind of lament where we're at currently is because the military used to try to make a man out of you. Like, like that was the thing. And, and in chapter Bravo, I love this story. So I want to tee it up for you to talk about it, but I, I'll tee it up with this quote. Becoming a man can mean many things to many people and most probably have uh, and, and most probably have a difficult time narrowing the nebulous process down to a single event. Not me. I can tell you the exact place and time when I crossed the threshold from boy to man. It was a hot, humid summer day in one of the toughest places on planet Earth, Marine Corps Recruit Depot, Paris Island, South Carolina. So for you... That was your rite of passage. What most boys don't ever experience, they self-initiate into manhood. You were initiated on that day. So talk to me about what went down on Paris Island. Yeah, I just got broken down. I got uh, called aside. I'm going to kind of like bounce out just so we can save it for the book. But, uh, I, you know, I was, they have the sand fleas. I'm freaking hurt. They're in, they're just annoying, big, big time nuisance. And I scratched it. You can't move. Like I just tried to get off my skin and I got caught moving. And they're like, uh, drill instructor called me out. He's like, recruit Penny. And he called me out. And he took me to uh, the the uh, the also famous sand pit, which are scattered around the islands. It's just a big sandbox where they can beat yeah. you. So we get in there. I put down my rifle. I take off my blouse. I'm just in my t-shirt, and my cami pants, and boots. And he just starts we're doing calisthenics, push ups, sprints, like anything to just like win me, get sweat going. The sweat started to drip in my eyes, and I kind of fall into the state of like feeling sorry for myself. And and this is like boy Eddie. Like this is mm-hmm. this is before the change happens. And I'm like, what's this guy doing? Doesn't he know he's like making me tired? I'm like, not realizing the big picture. Like, bro, you're in Marine Corps boot camp. And you're at that point back in 1996, we're trying to make men, which is not the same as Marine Corps boot camp back in like 84. All right. Mm -hmm. Totally different. Two different things. Uh, But there, but he started making me do these sprints. And I'm like, I couldn't make the time because the times were made to be met. It was to test my mental fortitude for sure. And he was breaking it and he was breaking it hard and he knew it. And I start crying. I start, I'm 17 years old, start crying and I'm hoping the sweat is like concealing my tears. And I, these guys aren't stupid. They know it all. Like they, they, this isn't his first rodeo. And he just looks at me and he tells me the, he kind of like has a very plain, normal voice, which I like the first time I think I've heard a normal voice from one of these guys mm-hmm. about discipline, about how important it is. Like it might seem like this, but over in combat, which there was no war going on, but if there was war, like something so small, like a movement could set off somebody from an ambush and kill mm. you or worse off the buddy next to you. Cause like no one wants to live with that. Like take me. Um, but he did that in like, while he was talking, like my mindset switch dude, it's like, okay, no more feeling sorry for Eddie. No more. Like it's time to rise up. It's time to man up. And I, I can't explain it. I didn't mean to, it wasn't like preemptive. Like I, I, it just, it just happened. And I, and I, 
and and he continued the beat session. To be honest with you, for a second, I thought it was over, but it wasn't. Uh, and he's like sprint sprints. So I'm like, but I had like this new fire in me. I was fierce. Right. So I was like, bring it. I, I think I, I'm like, let's go, let's go. Like bring it on. And I did the same stuff in buds. Like it's just, I can, I can activate it now. And it, it's, um, it was awesome, dude. But that was the moment that my lifestyle changed. My mindset changed and I became a freaking man in my mind. That's, that's when it happened. 100%. Dude. Yeah, the the guy uh, I think it has John Eldridge has told me this before. You're ushering a boy into manhood, like you're showing them the way. And some people do it on accident. Like I feel like my dad ushered me into manhood on accident because he wasn't, you know, really trying that hard. But this is also a man that lost his father when he was 13, and so he had to kind of figure out the whole man thing by himself. But that that was a, a very uh, big moment for you because obviously you were in the Marine Corps before you went to the SEALs, um, you know, when you're in the Marines, you kind of discovered a, a niche that was very, very good for you, you know, a close quarters battle. You do a lot of uh, description of that in the book. But in the Charlie chapter of the book, while you're still in the Marines, your entire military career, and I didn't know this until I read the book, and, and I thought it was fantastic. Your entire military career, Eddie, and, and really your entire life was altered forever because you messed up one time. A so failure. You, yeah, you, you messed up. You missed one shot and and it literally changed the entire trajectory of your entire career so so take us through that shot because that missing of that shot made the decision for you to leave the United States Marine Corps and go and try and be a seal so go for it yeah um it kind of goes for those unanswered prayers right sometimes you don't know what the heck you're talking about just keep yeah. marching on uh but don't worry I, I, there was a couple of months where i felt sorry for myself like dude this sucks i'm gonna go i'm getting out of the military i'm not gonna do my dream i'm like man that's like that's just not who i am it didn't sit right and i don't know what exactly turned the tides but i was like i'm switching over and i'm gonna go be a seal so you can imagine the naysayers and like you're an idiot like you can't even get into sniper school in the marines and now you want to go to be a seal one of the most demanding and rigorous trainings there are on the on this planet and I was like, yep. And everyone's like, man, you know what the attrition, I mean, you hear all the negatives, all the negatives. And like, I knew me, I knew my heart. And that was like another, like what I like call little crucibles in my life. It's like, I know myself, like I know me better than anyone knows me. And that, that goes for anyone. People are like, oh, you're not going to be good at this. Oh, this really isn't for you. Oh, you, you know that about me? How do you know that? Do you have ESP? No, you don't. You don't know about anything about me. Um, so, and, and it's just like, and there it was, I never failed a freaking event. I went, I, freaking destroyed it. It was, it, it sucked. It was a butt kicker. Uh, but, but that was like, yeah, that missed shot three times. Like I, I tried actively to like, like this is before prayer and all, all this stuff. And, uh, uh, it just, there was a different plan for me and thank God for that. Thank God for those failures. Thank God. When I, it's you good. know, I look knocked down, we're going to get knocked down. Right. It's like, do you get knocked down and you stay down? Or do you get knocked down and you get right back up and now you're stronger and you just learn something? Yeah, it's like, are you going to be able to wring out a lesson from your failure? So to kind of go back to jujitsu, I've lost one match in my entire competition career. It was my very first tournament and I lost the the absolute uh, quarter or semifinal match to a guy that outweighed me by about 80, 85 pounds, but I could have beat him. I had him in an arm bar uh, that that I didn't know how to break his grip and finish. I'd been training for six months. He ended up sweeping me, he ended up beating me. But it's like, from that moment forward, if I get that position again, I'm taking the arm because I, I focused all my energy towards not making that mistake again. Now, mm -hmm. now in your situation, that mistake, if you can call it that, led you into kind of a different path. And, you know, you do write an entire chapter about your, your buds uh, experience. And, hey, you know, we're not going to get into how tired, cold, wet, and sandy you were. I think that's been written enough Too times. That you did. That's why we yeah. put mandatory buds chapter. Right. It's the, uh, <laughs> you it's still got to tell the story. <laughs> right. It's the obligatory chapter. But yep. there was one thing that was very important. And you basically were talking about the difference between between the mindset in the Marine Corps versus what it was going to be like in the Navy SEALs. And so the first time, I think this is when you were arrived in Coronado for in-doc. And so this is like pre-buds, buds kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. And you run into uh, one of the instructors and he sees that you have um, a, a, a sharpshooter ribbon on you. Uh, and so like you had to change out one ribbon for the, the Navy version or something mm -hmm. like that. But this guy comes up to you and says, sharpshooter, huh? And he kind of tapped on your dress whites. He tapped on the ribbon. He says, we're going to make that an expert. And so for you, that was kind of like your first 
tell your first hint that the SEAL culture was going to be very, very different from the culture that you experienced in the Marines, Extremely. which also has a very, very strong culture. So talk to me about that, that brain shift, because a lot of civilians don't really know kind of the culture differences between the two branches. Yeah. When he said that I was very taken back by it, I, I thought I was waiting for something really, you can't shoot an expert or, or some kind of smart aleck remark. Uh, but he said that it's like, and you say, that's just the SEAL culture. It's like, all right, we're going to fix this. We're going to make this happen. We will get the job done. It's like, and in that moment, I'm like, these, we're, these, these guys are here for us. Like yeah. they're putting us, th they're about to put us through a freaking butt kicker of a workout and uh, this school, but they're, they're ultimately here for us. And I was like, man, you're investing in me. Like, that's really cool. Like that, I like, that's just something that stuck out. I'll never, like, it was just one of the things we'll make that better. And I was like, darn right you are. Cause I ain't quitting. So <laughs> we'll make that better. And I it was uh, one line, one sentence, life changing. Well, Let's talk a little bit more about that because there was a, there was a, a one sentence line that I think kind of leads you into the stuff you're doing today with unafraid and all this mindset stuff. But you, you said this about your mindset of buds and then we'll put a, we'll put a bow on buds is you said, I knew that quitting was not in my future. Like I, I, I think you, you use that phraseology very specifically. I knew that quitting was not in my future. Now I have talked to, to seals that have gone to buds that said something similar. Like I knew I wasn't going to quit. I've talked to other seals that went there that were like, Oh, I didn't know I wasn't going to quit. I just had to make the decision, you know, every day, like every hour, every minute that I wasn't going to quit. But you said that you knew that you weren't going to quit once you got there. So just simply, how did you know that? Well, it's simple. There's tons of guys before me that made it through the training. Why are they different than me? They're not. Um, I had like, barring an injury, which can happen and definitely can set you back and get you rolled out or kicked out. Uh, I just, I knew in my heart and in my soul, like it, it was not happening. I would not quit. Like it just wasn't happening. I wouldn't have it. I wouldn't entertain the idea. Did it surface sometimes in hell week and other times? I'd be like, yeah, get out. I'd kick it out. I would just be like, get out of here. It's not happening. I'm not quitting because either I'm going to have to redo it again and it doesn't matter. So I might as well knock it on the first try or... <laughs> You just put your head down and walk and I don't want to deal with that guilt for the rest of my life. So it's not happening. That was it. Yeah. You definitely didn't want to be on a fleet. Yeah. You didn't nope. want to be out at sea or any of those nope. different things. Um, but for you, the interesting thing for whenever you decide you wanted to become a SEAL, we weren't at war technically at this time period. So when you were in the Marines, we weren't in any kinetic wars around the country, but you were actually in the Bud's compound when America was attacked on September the 11th, 2001. So you, you do a lot of detailing it in the book. So we'll leave a little bit of that uh, for the future reader of that book. But take us through that because now you're not just training to be a really bad dude. You're not just training to be a commando. You're not just training so you look cool, you know, at a local bar in Coronado. It's like, oh, we're training to go and even the score. So take us through that. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't, I wouldn't say it changed my mindset, but it changed my mindset. Like, the goal of the teams is to be ready for anything that pops off at a moment's notice. Like that is what you're, you're just waiting to, for it to inevitably happen. Cause it's going to happen. Like that terror will always be here, period. Evil will always be here. Um, but as soon as that happened, it's like, okay, now we have a mission. This is our new mission. Obviously it had to develop. We had to figure out what we're doing and where we're going. But I was like, this gives a whole new meaning to my training is like, I will, it, it was different. Like it, it, when will it show up? And it's here in front of your face are two different things. And we still trained our butts off, but it just like, Hey, like this is real. Like we knew, we knew the, the surrealism of it. Like we, this was, this was about to happen. Like this was going to happen once we left this uh, training. And we did hope that our training would be called short to push us through <laughs> to deploy, but that never happened. <laughs> Well, so the funny thing about that is as you read it again, I'm a civvy, I'm a civilian. I grew up in, in Lawton, Fort Sill. So I was around guys like that all the time. And so I was, I was there in town when, you know, the, the gas station lines were super long when everybody on Fort Sill was worried because it's like, oh, you know, we're the largest uh, artillery base uh, in, in the country at the time. And, you know, we're wondering if, if that was going to be attacked and like, it was a very, very crazy time. But that's the thing about you guys and your mindset is you hope you get to go to war. I have right. not talked to a single guy that was a SEAL or a Green Beret or a Ranger or something like that that was like, man, I was really crossing my fingers that they wouldn't send us. It was like, no, 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 no. It's right across your chest right now. Here I am. Send me. Send me. It's my it. turn. Yeah, right. It's, like, yeah. you, it's like what you were wired and built to do. So it's like I, I try to explain to people this is kind of like a micro example, but I think it'll make sense. Like if somebody's wired for entrepreneurship, but they keep taking jobs at places where they're just going to be another face in the cubicle farm, it's like, bro, you're never – 
you weren't built for that environment. All right. So that like that's putting that's putting a fish, you know, on land. Like you weren't built right. for that. Same okay. thing is if you're not built for entrepreneurism, but you read a bunch of, you know, John Maxwell books and random self-help books. And you're like, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. If you're not built for it, it's not for you, but you guys were built for this. You were built to go down range, but in going down range, there are some casualties that come with that. And I don't mean necessarily, uh, you know, real life casualties, you know, because of you getting hurt in warfare, there are other types of casualties. So you talked about when you went to SEAL Team 2, you went through the entire process of how you got to SEAL Team 2 and how you wanted to be there. But you, your entire personhood was wrapped up in being a member of the teams. But at the time, you were a husband and a father as well, but you were completely absent. So I want to read a, a quote, actually, because you talk about that in Chapter Foxtrot, but I want to actually read a, a quote from Chapter Hotel here. I returned home from six months in Iraq. So this is obviously after your first deployment, I believe. You hugged, uh, hugged my wife and daughter and immediately went to work preparing for my next deployment. We were experiencing what many military families, especially those in special operations, were going through at the time. The wars came first, family came second. So it's obviously a well-known thing that uh, members of the spec ops community, the divorce rates are through the roof, you know, over 90%. Um, you mm -hmm. know, it's one of those things that guys try to, you know, they, they do their best at the time, but it's kind of hard to be worried about, you know, the dryer not working at home when you're you're on a mission trying to make sure that you don't lose your top knot. And so it, it's one of those situations that I understand it and I also don't understand it because you have this desire to be a good father. Uh, you have this desire to be a better father than the father you experienced. And yet you just went down the exact same path. And so kind of take me through that situation. I know you spend a lot of time on it in the book, but this is your father all over again. But now the the collateral damage is your wife and your children. <clears throat> yeah. It, it, yeah. I, my mindset really wasn't uh, thinking about my family at all. Like I would be, it, it, it's so sad to even say those words, but th that's just the, the truth of it. Is it's like, all right, the country where we're getting attacked, like could the, another one come up? There's this war on terrorism, you know, all this stuff. Uh, you're, you're getting behind the media hype. You're getting behind, like your, your buddies are getting destroyed. You want to take it to the enemy. Uh, yeah, it, it was my priority. Now it, that wasn't like that for everyone. I'm, there, there's guys that were strong in their faith and they did the right thing. They had that well balanced. I didn't have that well balanced, man. I really didn't. Um, I didn't have Christ in my life at that time. I I had alcohol in my life at that time and in killing savages. That's really all I cared about. That was it was like my identity it was like my lifestyle it was like my blood. It was like my breath of fresh air was putting a bullet in someone's face. Like it, that's just the fact of the matter, because since I was a kid, I wanted to rid evil. Like, I don't like evil. I don't like bad guys. But yet, here I am, pretty much the evil guy in my family. In my, in my, under my roof, I'm that evil dude that's not being present. And they took a back seat, and that sucks. That sucks to say I was 100% wrong. Uh, my Those failures in my family were very, everyone's 100% responsible, but I take full responsibility for my piece of it, for sure. Uh, I screwed up. I screwed up bad. And uh, I didn't really realize it was happening. And that's not an excuse. That's not a scapegoat. That's not a way out of it. I messed up, dude. I messed up hard. I messed up real well, hard. So, and you're obviously very candid about that in the book. Like you don't try to make yourself out to be this, you know, hero that we're all supposed to feel bad for. Yeah, like you, you, yeah. you don't make yourself the sympathetic character at all, which I appreciate. But I, I guess I was jotting down as you were talking is like, how, how can we, and I say we as the, as Americans, as people that support the military or whatever, like how can we make sure that guys like you don't make those mistakes? That's a silly, even as I'm saying it, that, that question, I'm not framing it the way that I want to, but I guess a better way to go about it, Eddie, would be if you could go back to the Marine Corps, or go back to whenever you got your trident or something like that, what would you do differently to make sure that your family could still be a priority? Because here's the, here's the reality is kids spell love T I M E. And if you're on a six month deployment yeah. and before that you were on a, you know, six month workup, like you can't, you know, feed them their bottle and take them to baseball practice and be in Afghanistan. Like you, yeah. you can't do both. So, so I, I know you're kind of lamenting the, the mistakes that you made, but could you, ha if you went back, is there a way to do it perfectly? I don't know if perfect's even in our vocabulary, but uh, could I have done it better? Absolutely. But at the same time, I look at my wife now, I look at my family now, wouldn't change a freaking thing. I wish I was there for my kids for sure more because uh, that that's what keeps you up at night sometimes. But, yeah. uh, you know, the SEAL teams don't put – when when multiple wars are going on, and and I don't, bl I don't blame them for this at all, is the priority is those wars. Like there's a lot of – there's a lot of moving parts, a lot of things going on. 
Um, and it's kind of up to you to maintain that family life. And I, and I, I was a, I was a boy. I was a boy when it came to that. I didn't know if I could change anything. I would, I would have freaking seeked God. That's what I would have done. That's what I would have done differently. Well, and I was even thinking about this today because, you know, everyone kind of has that nagging thing in the back of their head about like, if you didn't go the military route, like, could you have made it through boot camp? Could you have made it through selection? Could you have made it through the Q course? Could you have made it through buds? And I think everyone kind of has that desire to kind of move that direction, but it's different if you've actually been through it. And it's very easy for me to armchair quarterback and be like, oh, well, just be a good dad and be a good seal at the same time. Right, yeah. Because when you're living it, <laughs> again, like I look at who I am now, like I'm 35 years old, right? Like, but whenever I was 25 years old, I feel like I still didn't have the mental maturity that some enlisted SEALs have when they're 18 years old, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's like, it's easy for me to say that when I'm twice these people's age and I'm more mature and I have more life experience, but it's, it's always hard looking back. You can only connect the dots looking backwards and not forward, unfortunately. But to kind of keep moving through the book, Eddie, in chapter golf, you get into your first op and things like that. And you do a lot of great detail going into that. But something interesting uh, where you started breaking down again, you were, you'd kind of, uh, been real attracted to CQB to close quarters battle. But in chapter hotel, you talk about whenever you became a breacher. And so again, in the book, you go into a great amount of detail as, as to all that. That was a huge step in your career when you did that. So I want you to take us through that a little bit, but specifically, and this is almost like a throwaway line in the book, but I kind of attached myself to it. You talked about how when you guys were downrange, you were trying to do everything you could to make your pack lighter, right? Like, cause you had so much stuff on your back and mm -hmm. that's hard on your body. It makes you move slower. You're, you're not as able to be as kinetic when you need to be kinetic. And so you were able to kind of make one, I guess it was one of the breaching charges significantly smaller than the ones that you, that you you were trained to use when you first got in. And you even said, I forget how you worded it, but it was like, that was one of my biggest you know, lasting contributions to the the special operations community, specifically to SEALs, specifically even more so to breachers, by almost inventing. You were you turned into an inventor and invented this small charge. So take us through the whole, you know, becoming a breacher thing, but specifically that charge that you created. Yeah, so we had to start going through walls because gunfire was, you know, going through the windows or the door because that's obviously the point of entry. Uh, and I think, like, usually casually is like 70% at that, we call it the fatal funnel, fatal funnel at the door. So like, hey, we let's go through the walls and the 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 charge that you're uh, that I was referring to in the book it was twenty pounds, twenty pounds added on to your body armor, your helmet, your gear. Uh, it's a lot. Of, it's a lot of weight. You you just don't want to do it. Uh, so I, I think I carried it on one up, and I was like, okay, this isn't happening. So I got with my master breacher. That was a he was a lot more savvy than I was. I'm like, hey, how do we do this? And then we started playing with some things. He's like, hey, let's try this. And then we just came up with where we could put. Um, what was supposed to be is two, two blocks of C4, which is like a three pounds. And then it, it the shock wave like cuts through whatever the, the, um, the material is. And then you dump in a thermobaric grenade and that, that, uh, concussion blows out the, the pressure blows out and makes a, a small hole, a huge hole to where you can get freaking dudes in. And it worked. I use, we use it quite a bit, quite a bit. That char, I would always have that charge of me. And once we saw the effectiveness, we were like, okay, the game just changed for us to our advantage. Uh, but yeah, he brought it up and they were like, we kind of fine tuned it. And that was one of the, and I just was the guy that always was testing it and refining it. And, um, and we found out later that that's what they were using and for future deployments, which is, is great to hear because dudes would always pass on, Hey, this works for us. Try it out. I'm like, dude, you just saved our lives. Thank you. So that, I mean, that's what it's about. And that's, that's a lesson learned in warfare that probably couldn't have been learned any other way because 100%. again, yeah, pre nine 11, a lot of the stuff, my understanding from the spec ops community, you're basically training in case a Vietnam type thing happened again. Now I know exactly. you guys were training for all the different theaters of war, but whenever you're spending 20 years specifically in a sandbox, that's, you know, marinated in blood, it's like you, you get creative to your exact scenario because that charge doesn't make sense in the jungles of Vietnam. No. Right. But it makes perfect sense in the scenario that you were in there. It was the same uh, thing like Black Hawk Down, like Black Hawk Down. We lost 19 Americans and everyone chalks it up as a huge failure. And it, it, it didn't turn out the way that we wanted for sure. But that one operation changed spec ops across the board for decades. And from that one, what people want to call failure, so many lives, hundreds of lives were saved. Like we do this now. We don't do this. We do this. I mean, it was it, I mean, that one uh, one operation changed the way spec ops did their business.
Yeah, it's just incredible. But again, uh, you wish that you didn't have to learn the lessons that way. But there, course, there does it does have a positive net impact on the back end. But Absolutely. in chapter in chapter India, Eddie, this is where you get into green team screening, and so this is the screening that you have to go through in order to become a part of Naval Special Warfare Development Group, which is again, you know, tier one of you know uh, the Spec Ops community of the Navy SEALs and things like that. Uh, you talked about a lot of things in that chapter, so I don't necessarily want to tee you up with a specific question because you talk about how you know in buds the instructors are trying to get you to. Quit it, but in green team, the instructors are just holding an unbelievably high standard. Like that's the difference. Like, like they don't want you to quit. They just want you to live up to the standard and they have no compunction about kicking you out if you don't meet the standard. But, um, in a lot of ways, it's of course physically uh, brutal on on you and on the body, uh, and, and you have to have this you know top tier physical prowess in order to be a part of that group. But just kind of take us through what what you want to do, because again, I don't want to take too much uh, too much sting away from the book, because you do a great job describing it. But there are a lot of people that are seals that are bad dudes that never got to screen. For, for that team that got there and were, were b busted out of there a lot. There's a lot of myths about, oh, you know, if your gun malfunctions, whenever you're in there, they'll kick you out because it's like, you know, the war gods are communicating to the instructors that this guy is going to, this is going to happen to him downrange. So take that wherever you want to go. Let's dispel some myths or talk a little bit about green team screening. It, it, it was a lot of pressure, man. It was, I, I think the selection was way harder than buds hands down. Like it was, it was, it was stressful, but it was so much fun. Like it was a blast. Like instead of like you, we just, we started off like seriously crawling before we could start walking, going in dry fire with our pistol only uh, doing room clearances Then we would graduate to live fire. Then we put it away and dry fire with our M4s. And then you would just grab, then you'd move it to nighttime. Uh, and they just want to make sure that you, everyone is, it's like you've heard, we've all heard. I'd rather train someone to shoot. That's never shot than train somebody to shoot that has all these bad habits. Right. It's kind of the same thing. So they're getting everyone, they're hitting the default button. Like this is how we do it because all the teams have different operators that learned this or learned that. They want everyone together because when you're doing cer certain operations, you got to know what everyone's going to do. You can't be mm -hmm. like, well, this is how I handled this, but this is how I, you just, it doesn't work that way. That, that's how people die. Um, so they get you back to default and that is, you have to kind of retrain so they put the training wheels on for a couple of days and they take them off and once and you can just gradually feel it. You can just start amping it up, start amping it up. And, and they, they want to see you amp it up on your confidence level. And once you amp it up and you're freaking zooming around everywhere, that's when they're like, okay, cool. That's what we want to see right there. And I, I remember like doing things that aren't by the book and that's what they want to see. Like, okay, cool. Go, go. Got it. Got it. Like th that's just what they would look at. They would just look for things like, all right, he's getting it. And this is for everyone. It's clicking with them. That's what works. He's backing up his boy. He's on, he's ready to go. All right. His secondary, whatever it is, they got to see your brain doesn't stop like jujitsu, right? Your brain yeah. doesn't stop. It shouldn't stop. Maybe when you're breathing too hard, uh, but like <laughs> it's got to keep going. It's got to keep going. What's the next step? What's the next step? All right. What's the next step? And then the next step, like you just got to have that chess match and that's what they're looking for. And um, yeah, it can be overwhelming, but buddy, it's a blast. It is a blast, especially if you have the passion for it, you know? Right. Well, you, you did get through the screening. You ended up, uh, becoming one of those super duper special seals or whatever <laughs> we're supposed to call them. Uh, thank you DOD for that. Yeah, but right. I, I wasn't planning on asking this question, but as you were talking, it reminded me of whenever I was talking with uh, another brother of yours that I don't know if I could, uh, use his name, but, uh, anyway, he was with you there when you were uh, there at the same time. And he didn't say this, but the way that he described it, whenever I was talking to him, there's almost like this, this suicide pact that you guys have in that community, that some of the missions that you guys go on, again, we don't typically hear about those missions unless they go incredibly wrong or unless it's politically expedient, you know, like, right. you know, whenever uh, Osama bin Laden uh, got his face split open. But it seems like you guys, as soon as you get on that team specifically, not just the SEALs, but on that team specifically, it's like, yeah, we're, we're probably going to die at some point. And it just kind of is what it is. We're going to try to take out as much as the, the enemy and you know push back as much evil as we can in the meantime. That's what it seems like to me. If I'm incorrect, please correct me. But if, if I am kind of touching on something there, can you talk a little bit more about that? You're not wrong. I remember when I was a SEAL team too, and I told him I was screening to go and a buddy was... He was actually one of the divers in Panama for uh, Noriega that put the mm -hmm. bomb on the uh, the ship. He goes, that's, he's like, he's like, people that go there, he's like, that's where they die. That's where the team guys usually die is at that command. And I was like, 
All right. Like it, it wasn't a stop. It wasn't like, okay, let's reassess this. It was like, Hey man, this is my mission. This is my passion. This is my purpose. I'm going, I'm going, it, it, it wasn't a factor. I'm like we'll build that bridge when we get there. I won't, I'm not going to live in fear. And I like, I know that that's where I'm supposed to go. And that's where I went. Fair enough. So that that's interesting uh, that most of you guys kind of share that and, you know, kind of a through point of your entire career. And you talk about this a lot in the Juliet chapter is uh, killing. Killing's a big part of your job. Uh, you know, you describe your first kill in there. You describe several of your kills, but you have a very uh, specific quote in there about killing. And again, this is all pre you becoming a Christian and, and really kind of making that a center point of your life. But I thought this was an interesting quote from that chapter. Later, the killing became so routine that we progressed towards increasingly difficult means to keep it interesting. When shooting bad guys with the rifle got old, I relished in the opportunity to justifiably use a pistol or even a knife when the situation permitted. In hindsight, it was reckless to not use the most effective weapon possible in every mission to ensure that I made it home safely, but that was not my attitude in the midst of war. You go to a different place when you're in that kind of combat on a daily basis. If you've never experienced it, you'll never understand. So... I've never experienced it, so I don't understand. I completely agree with you. But there are a lot of people that will read that section of your book, and it uh, it confirms all of their worst suspicions of you guys. That you guys are bloodthirsty. You're actually murderers, but this is state-sanctioned murder, and it's part of the military-industrial complex, and you're a baby killer, and you'll do anything to kind of get your rocks off by, by shedding blood and all that. And again, it's kind of easy to, to push those things out there, but intellectually, that is a point that you have to reckon with because it's like, it seems like for a lot of you guys, you're either, you know, very dismissive of killing or you really, really, really enjoy it. And that causes concerns here on the home front because there are people that want to kill people that they enjoy the thought of doing it and then they go out and do it and they kill a bunch of civilians. But kind of take me through that again. This is pre your Christian walk. I, we don't have to spend a lot of time talking about thou shalt not murder. We don't have to spend a lot of time going into all those different things. You were killing enemy combatants that wanted to kill you, wanted to kill your brothers. And if they got the opportunity, would come over here and kill as many of us as possible. But just talk to me a little bit about that. And they do it with a smile on their face as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that, that is, I mean, it got to the point where it's like, okay, man, I wonder what it'd be like to kill somebody with this, this uh, platform or do this. And that is simple as like, Hey, I could, I could use my rifle or sling it, pull out my pistol. Cause it's a tight area. And hopefully there's a bad guy in here. Not, I mean, yeah, hopefully like I want to get the bad guys cause there's shooters running around here and we better get them before they get us. So that's kind of what that means is like, I would do anything to be put on my sidearm and get a sidearm kill over something I've already gotten dozens with. So mm -hmm. yeah, the people can, I could put in there. I love teddy bears. They're so soft and so fluffy. Somebody will have an issue with it. And I honestly yeah. don't give a crap. I, I just don't care. That's what it is. That was my mindset is like, yeah, you want to, I remember I set off a charge and it freaking flattened a dude. And I was like, wow, that is my first breaching kill. That was freaking awesome. That guy had a pile of grenades by him and machine guns with two snipers on the other side of the room with him. So yeah, he's a bad dude. And I don't feel any guilt whatsoever. I wish there was three of them sitting there that were bad guys. So yeah, I, I dude, I was into it. I was into it. Well, it's kind of the thing that, uh, I remember talking with, uh, another buddy of yours that, that was in that bill rapier and, you know, talking to him, like he was a Christian the entire time he was doing That's these awesome things. That, man. that dude's a stud by the way. Yeah, dude, he, we, we really enjoyed, stud. we Love enjoyed him. our conversation with him and I have not talked to a single person that knows him that has an ill, ill thing to say about the guy. The guy seems to have a tremendous reputation. I uh, spent a lot of time in, in that special super duper seal unit. Um, and the thing that's, that's cool about how he described it is he talked about it as a Christian about, you know, we do have this, um, this, mandate from God to protect image bearers of Christ. And that's the one thing that these, these people don't take into account these anti-war people and all that. It's like, do you guys know what these people are doing to their own people? Do you know about the, the subjugation that they put their own populace in? Like, look, we have the Taliban retaking Afghanistan and Afghanistan has long been out of the, uh, out of the news headlines and all that, but the things they're doing, uh, on a daily basis over there are absolutely horrific. And it's like, you have to talk to someone who was actually on the ground there. Like I had Tim Kennedy on the show here recently, and he was talking about this is, you know, not on the show. We, we talked about this uh, privately whenever we were uh, with each other in DC not that long ago. We talked about 
how the Taliban was not being portrayed correctly in the media as as savage as they were. The Taliban was outside the wire of H. Kaya, and they were literally executing people in front of the Marines that were guarding the ex, uh, the exterior walls of the facility or whatever to try and goad the Marines into doing something. They're murdering women and children, slicing their throats and cutting their heads off right in front of all these people. And it's like, you don't understand evil. Like you watch a few Netflix series and a few movies and you think you understand evil. Like you've seen it. You've smelled it People Eddie. No it's it's different like we'll talk a little bit about that because it's like i can't stand it when i see these political pundits or, or these war correspondents that almost are trying to make us feel bad for for saying that the taliban are these evil people or that al-qaeda or boko haram or isis or isis k that oh they're these evil people they're almost trying to treat it like oh they're not evil they're just misunderstood i, I think it's crazy it, it is crazy it's like we, we see a car crash. We're like, man, that really sucks. That, that that really sucks seeing that car crash as you drive by slowly causing more traffic. It's different when you're in that car crash. Can we agree on that? Like that is a totally different feel. Like, yeah. holy crap. I almost thought that's what witnessing this stuff is. We can talk about it. We can see the movies when you're in the safety of your own couch and you're drinking your little wine cooler, whatever the hell it is. But when you see it in your freaking front of your face and you can feel it, you can hear it. You can hear the groans. You can hear the screaming. You can he see the reactions of other people that are bystanders. Bro, it's real, real. And, I, and I, 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 this is in the book is that we found that disc of a guy that I, I shot. And uh, he's doing ballistic tests on KBR Filipino truck drivers on the side of the road. He's got him staked on the side of the road doing ballistics, not using a jello mold, but using rib cages, legs, heads, necks, stabbing him, shooting him weird things like and just hearing their screams and seeing their faces and this is like these this is what they do people don't get that like like evil from what the majority of americans and this world think is evil ain't freaking evil that's like kitty land crap like there's some real freaking evil dude like real evil there you go, guys. I hope you enjoyed part one of this interview with Eddie Penny. But before we let you go, we are going to do a quick resilience boost. At Undaunted Life, our mission is equipping men to push back darkness with content that forges spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. And before we get to the links, do not forget to support the sponsor of today's show. That's Kansas City Cattle Company, KC Cattle Company. Go to kccattlecompany.com. That's kccattlecompany.com. Use the promo Kyle to get 15% off of your order. Again, that promo code is just my first name, Kyle. That's K-Y-L-E for 15% off of your order at kccattlecompany.com. So the links for today, I've got a link to the brand new book by Eddie Penny. That's unafraid. It's an Amazon link. Go and get that first edition hardcover, pick it up. It'd be awesome. Make sure you support him. I've also got a link to Eddie's website, a link to the contingent group website and his two other appearances on this show. All right, guys, thanks so much for listening to this show. We do appreciate it. Wherever you're listening to this, please subscribe, rate, and leave us a positive five-star review. If you want to come speak live at your event or on your podcast, just shoot me an email to info at undaunted.life. That's I-N-F-O at undaunted.life. Follow us on Instagram and like us on Facebook and check out our website for everything else including how to donate to keep more content like this coming your way, just go to www.undaunted.life. And as always, we want to thank the band August Burns Red for allowing us to use their music for our content. The music on this podcast is our song Cutting the Ties, which is off the 10th anniversary re-recording of their album, Leveler. The links are in the description. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Remember, keep pushing back darkness, keep forging spiritual, mental, and physical resilience, keep seeking the Lion of Judah.